My first guest started his life as an apprentice plumber, which is, strictly speaking, what he still is. What happened was his plumbing apprenticeship was deferred when he became a pop star, and he's never n bothered to buy himself out. He's one of the few people who survived the butterfly existence of being a pop singer to build a reputation as an all-round entertainer. He was one of the Australian stars selected for the Royal Variety Concert, which is, as they say, a far cry from Dagenham, where he was born. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Farnham. <laughs> I much enjoyed that uh, Royal Variety concert, and I also very much enjoyed your, your part in it. Thank you I very much. I thought it was a highlight of it. You enjoy it yourself? Very much indeed. I don't think I've ever been as nervous in my whole life. Really? I, I think somebody just before I went on said that there were about 11 million people watching. And uh, you make a blue in front of 11 million people, you've really made a blue. That's right, yeah. And you, you had some problem with the lyrics, didn't you? Which, I mean, you were telling me that you forgot the lyrics of the... Well, I, I'm noto apparently notorious. For forgetting words, I, I do it all the time, even songs that I've been singing for ten years. And uh, I, I never actually had a problem with the lyrics with Help, which was the song I, I did right. on the command performance. I, I did mess up a part of the thing where there was a big yell for help just after the band break, and uh, I forgot to do it. Mm -hmm. And I heard an audio tape of it the next day, and it really annoyed me because I wanted to get it right on that night of all nights. You know? What was the worst, though, forgetful moment for you as a, as a singer? Well, apart from most every live television show I've ever done, I've made a mistake. I mean, I have this recurring dream of uh, making a mistake in the middle of the song, like they do on New Faces and having to walk off and come on again. You know, this, <laughs> it really, no, really, I go through that every time I do a live television show. But I think the the one that I remember most of all is uh, the Tokyo Song Festival. Um, Brian Cadd, who's an Australian songwriter, asked me to perform on his behalf at the Tokyo Song Festival a song called "Don't You Know It's Magic," and um, I got up in in front of 14,000 Japanese people who didn't know who I was or what I was talking about and saying totally and utterly different words. And Brian was in the front row going, oh. <laughs> and I, I just, he's never forgiven me for it and still reminds me of it. But what happened? <laughs> John's so damn humble. John, you're a good guy, man. Ah, good looking fellow he was, wasn't he? Bloody good looking. <laughs> Now, I've seen this, and I haven't heard anybody um, uh, request this, but, sorry, I just did a reaction with uh, Olivia and Dolly Parton and singing Jolene, and it just makes me sad seeing John again and, and talking to the Aussies, because I wanted to do Olivia, John, and trying to start this cold chisel concert, not knowing the names of the songs, because Dr. Cap can't remember which one she sent me, and I probably lost the first one. So it'll be the second one. Anyway, just um, wanted to give shout-outs to Olivia and John and uh, Bon Scott, <laughs> my original favorite Aussie, besides Bob Hogan and... I had a crush on the damn Crocodile Hunter's daughter, man. I think she's way too young for me. I would imagine. <laughs> That's terrible. Isn't it? I have a crush on all the girls, man. Kate. I'm just, I love Vanessa. I mean, she could be my sister, my mom, my, my little niece. So I wouldn't care. To your your entrance, your 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 song in the contest. Oh well, we won the the. Uh, oh right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, get... No, we were very lucky. Well, they didn't know I made any mistakes. You didn't there. get the best lyric, did you, man? No, we de <laughs> definitely didn't get that. But I, no, I didn't say it's all right. He's still mad at me, Dave. But we won everything. <laughs> so humble. I, I we won the. Um, the best performance of a composition and the most outstanding composition. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said in the introduction, you went overnight, more or less, from being a, a plumber. I mean, were you a good plumber? Yes, I was. The only thing, really, that plumbing did for me was stop me biting my fingernails. I mean, it's just <laughs> a thing that you never do when you're a plumber. Uh, but I think I would have made a good plumber because I enjoyed it. Why don't plumbers bite the fingernails? That's what I want to know. Why? Mm. Well, I thought, should, thought it was obvious. Really. No, no, no. <laughs> do, in fact, I mean, do you still plumb around the house? Yes, I do. You do? Uh, occasionally, I, 
Like if we get a leaky tap, uh, I'll go and fix it. Um, Graham Goble, who is my record producer, um, has just bought a new house in Melbourne, and I rewash it all the taps in the, in the house. What's funny about that? A thousand dollars for it? That's no, I didn't really. Actually, I, that's cheap. <laughs> yeah, that's a lovely, lovely bit of useless Im information, that which I, I collect snippets of useless information. I'm about to tell people that Johnny. I'm sorry, Australia, but I can tell you collect useless information. You jackrabbit! Why the hell did you tell John what he said was useless? Where are you now? Probably six foot under a box. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure he's like Walter Bronkite. Bronkite, Cronkite to y'all. Us, I don't know. I don't know who he is. He made me mad talking about John, damn it. Get in line with John Stevens. I ain't gonna put your name in the thumbnail. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That wasn't nice. I found this plumbing around his mate's houses, and they'll say, That's very interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But that's not right. She went overnight, and that's that's literally true, isn't it? From being a plumber to being a pop star, how difficult was it to to adjust? Well, I mean, the dif the difficulty they weren't really difficulties. I... John, all he's got to adjust is his chair as he talks to you. Ask him how long it took him to develop those skills. <laughs> Item done. Done. Quit throwing shit at me. Oh, damn, man. I mean, there was definitely an adjustment there. I mean, I, I, I left work two days before my first record was released. And uh, I used to come home and just say, well, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to be a plumber or a rock and roll singer? And I only had one chance at being a rock and roll singer, and I chose it. I, I think the main effect happened later, because I was three feet off the ground from the day Sadie came out and slipping around the country once every six weeks. Um, but I think the main thing is that I missed out on being a teenager, really, from 17 till to 22. Well, what was that missing out period like, though? I mean, what was the... We're going back how many years now? Oh, I don't remember. About 10 years. About 10 years. Yeah, 10 yeah. years. And that, I mean, it really was a fairly hysterical period in pop music, <laughs> it wasn't was. it? What was the hysteria like surrounding you? It was wonderful. I got touched in places I haven't got, you know... It, really? It, it, <laughs> it really... The really frightening part about it, and uh, it's not frightening when now when I think about it, I mean, it was absolutely amazing. But the really terrifying part about that whole thing was that I'd go and do a show somewhere, and you'd all get a thousand, you'd get a thousand people all trying to touch you at the same time. And that is, that is terrifying, absolutely frightening. But you know that they're doing. The gentleman that kicked the thousandth goal. Everyone requested, nobody watched. <laughs> Sorry. That's the businessman in me. But y'all attacked him. With our, the Australian people attacked him. That, it took him like three hours. It got ridiculous I watched this alone. Maybe that's why nobody watches it. Cause they're like, dude, why did you record the whole thing? It took him like three hours to get out of there. But like, you can see relief on his face. Like, you know, somebody... A helicopter just saved you off an island with no water or something with the big alligators and crocodiles. <laughs> it's that ain't the same thing, but no pun intended, Mr. Crocodile Hunter. Rest in peace. <laughs> John kind of looks like a uh, <laughs> uh, old crikey. Steve Irwin. Not really. A little bit. Doing it, or, or most of them, hopefully, are doing it because they like you. Mm. But uh, you get a thousand people trying to shake your hand at the same time, it, it really can knock you over. Talking about being touched in places you didn't know you had, I remember <laughs> that uh, Dirk Bogard once told me that when he was starting as a film star in England, as you recall, he, went, he was sort of ranked charm school and built up this big sex image, that when he had to go and make a personal appearance, he had to sew his flies up. <laughs> <laughs> All the man was. No, I... You didn't do the same thing? No, no, I used to put Velcro on my That's that stuff that sticks together. <laughs> Look, I'm going to guess that this gentleman over here is not Australian. He's English. I'm just going to guess. I love all of you English people that I know. I love you all. 
Y'all are a little stuck up, but I love you. Or prissy, or... <laughs> and no, I, I don't mean gay people. Don't mean, I just, British people do that. Did I say English? What is the difference in English and British? Damn it. I just now learned what the difference in a Kiwi and an Aussie is. And I, recently I learned the difference in Scottish and Swedish. Wait a minute. Swiss, Swiss and Swiss. Swedish, they're not the same. And Ireland and Scotland is totally different. Totally different, but the same. Different, though. So, I'm looking outward, okay? <laughs> I'm trying my best. It's hard. And the two giants had built a big bridge across the oceans with rocks or something. One was way bigger than the other one, so he acted like a baby and cowered it out or something with a giant pathway in Scotland. I don't know. Anyway, back to Farnsey. <laughs> they got off on a rant, didn't they? <laughs> Bloody rant. No, I, I never had to do that. Uh... <laughs> Never found it necessary, really. Well, let me ask you another question, then. What about what about the problem with groupies? Were there any? Oh, countless. Were there? Yes. Uh, I can remember stories, um, funny, funny incidences, but embarrassing at the same time. I was in in uh, in Melbourne doing it. No, actually, I'm sorry, it was in Adelaide doing a show, and uh, I'd come back from the show and, and went to my hotel room, and there were four very young girls in the room. Otherwise, I could have been in a lot of trouble. And... And, uh, John, you're such a good guy. Are you telling the same story that you told in the other interviews I've seen you about these girls, and you told them to leave. And John, I think this is a cover story for all your real groupie nights. Come on, man. You got to have more stories than this one when you were 17 or whatever. Story, John. John, come on, man. Be more like Jimmy. <laughs> Channel your inner Jimmy, John. Jimmy John. Whoa. I, I walked in, and, and three of them were in my bed, and one of them was in the shower. Same story. And I, I mean, you know, I just didn't know what to do. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I, I really you didn't. Mean, you didn't know whether to take a shower or go to bed. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. That was good. <laughs> Wish I'd have said that. <laughs> I really do. No, I, I just didn't know what to do, and, and I thought, well, at least these young girls are in my room, and they always blame the fella. Mm. So I just bundled all their clothes up and, and them all in the one sort of little pile and put them outside the door and tried to forget about it. It took me three months. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever, ever have any literally beating the door down? Yes, I, I had a, an awful experience once going back to hotel rooms. It always happens in hotel rooms. Um, I, I was in a country town in Victoria, and as I walked through the foyer of the hotel, there was a wedding going on in one of the reception rooms, and uh, there were, uh, the bride and the bridesmaid spied me, you see, and was, oh, come and have photographs taken around the cake. You know, it was one of those, so I, I thought, oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll go and have photographs taken around the cake. And I stood there and cuddled the bride and cuddled the bridesmaid, and everything was terrific like that. And then I, I left and went up to my room, and I heard a very slight knock on the door and I thought it was my manager. So I opened the door and it was the bridesmaids. Bridesmaids? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I nearly died and they banged their way into the room. There was about five of them and a, and a flower girl. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I just didn't know what had happened and all of a sudden they were in, I, it had never happened to me before either, but they were instantly into all of my clothes. They were in them, uh, under the bed in my suitcases looking for old toothbrushes and ties and things like that to take as you know i suppose they were going to hang them around their necks and <laughs> i after about 10 minutes bundled them all outside and about 15 minutes later there was a knock on the door again and the bride was with the bridesmaids and a few of the female guests from the show and they barged their way in again and did all that and the bride got upset i don't really want to get married because of it all. and she's sitting on the end of my bed <laughs> crying in her bridal gown with the bridesmaids going, yeah, it's awful, isn't it? And I'm going, oh, don't worry, love. Everything will work out. 
Well, just then the doors burst, it o burst open and there was the groomsman and the bride's father in there. <laughs> and, 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 and the groom, you see? So I've gone, oh, look out, John, you're in for a blood nose here. I can feel it coming, you know. So these guys got me bailed up into the corner and they were about to hurt me. <laughs> sort of a better word. And I just sort of, oh, go away. I did all that sort of thing and said, oh, I had nothing to do with this. I mean, they just came into the room. And I, the guys got a bit upset and left in a rage. And I was bundling these women out. And as I did, one of the, one of the lady guests, or one of the girl guests, uh, she was about 17, fell over at the door and twisted her kneecap around here. I don't know how she did it, but it came all the way around to the side of her leg. You know, and I thought, oh, no. And the photographer from the wedding's there, and he's gone, click. <laughs> See? And he came up to me afterward, and he said, right, uh, this will cost you $2,000, otherwise I'll put it in the paper. Really? So without further thought, I threatened him. Uh, I threatened to introduce him to the bridegroom, actually. <laughs> uh, and I t just told him to go away and know on certain terms. And the, the, the photograph was in the local paper, and I got a letter from the bride and groom about four weeks later from Queensland, where they'd been on their honeymoon saying how much they enjoyed meeting me. <laughs> Some people are so thick, I thought I was really going to get into trouble over there. That's the old thing, there's no secure as folk. Yes. But, but talking about, about brides and bridegroom and all that sort of thing, what, what was the reaction of your, your fans when you got married? Because it's actually the worst thing that the, a pop star can do, isn't it, is to get married? Well, so they say. Well, I mean, I, from, the, from the fans' point of view. From the fans' point of view, point of view right. yeah. I, um, well, I, some very funny things. I mean, my wife got all those, uh, you know, awful threatening letters and things like that which she's very understanding about. She doesn't like him, but she understands. Uh, and I got the same thing. But one very funny story um, happened. Was some, there was a group of, of girls that used to come to every show I've done in Victoria. No, seven or eight of them still come. And Comment below, I see, Army. Because I screen re recorded this because I seen it earlier. I wanted to do it quietly. And... Right, I'd be hooked to Wi Fi or whatever, just in case. And I don't remember the name of it, so I really can't put his name in there. I don't remember. I guess I could go look at my history. But let me know if anybody was there at this show. And if this is a popular show, is it still on? Is this like Jay Leno or is here a late night public TV or is this Channel 9? Ain't that y'all? Big channel. I think it's whatever that channel is there. Hey, what just happened? I think I'm good. Um, they, four of them arrived at my wife's home in Glenroy. And another one came in behind them and she had a knife in her sock and a wedding present in her hand. And my wife opened the door. She said, I came to stab you in the back. Happy wedding. <laughs> and she invited her in for a cup of coffee. And this, this young girl was, was threatening, threatening, <laughs> threatening with a knife at one stage and, and handing mm. a gift in the other. Mm. It was just like that. It was mm. uh, it's a strange thing. I still get people coming up to me and saying, you know, very pretty young ladies of 20 and 23 come up and saying, I was a fan of yours when I was five, but I grew out of it. <laughs> and it really upsets me. I mean, you've grown out of it too, in a sense, haven't you? I mean, you did, uh, you did uh, Charlie Girl and then Pippin, which sort of led you into a, another area for which you must have been very thankful i would imagine i was at the time um because i'd been i'd been doing what i do for for five years up mm. until charlie girl and it was a brand new thing charlie girl was either a, a make or break for me and i'm very very lucky that it worked um and i enjoyed it i i, I believe in diversification i believe particularly in australia we've got 14 million people and you can't keep everyone happy for very long Mm. Uh, they do get sick of you, and, and that's a fact of life. So I had to do as many different things as I could, and Charlie Girl was a perfect opportunity. And you worked with old Nemo, didn't you? My yeah, mate on that. Old Decker. He's a character. Oh, sure is. Yeah. He, I, I learned. All right, John, he's a realist. He doesn't um, over exaggerate or over expect things or over promise things to people. He's very calculated and thinking about his family and his personal life and keeping that separate from the job, also respecting the job and keeping his personal life from interfering in certain aspects there. He's juggled that very well to have been juggled around by so many, um, 
not so great coordinators in his time as a rock god. What else you call him? I mean, he's he's rock rock and roll royalty. That you put him right there. I will stand firm though. I've always said Michael Jackson was the best performer I ever seen, and a few of you have started to sway me towards thinking John Farnham could possibly take that category. I just watched this thing though ten times. Michael Jackson forgot he was human. This new thing. I got to stick with it. Michael Jackson is the best entertainer I've ever seen. Just to take a man. I don't want to say a mic stand. <laughs> Let's keep the mic stands out of it. Just a man on a stage with a crowd and a beat. Yeah, man, Michael Jackson, he has hit notes that were just unbelievable to hit. High, low, I mean, not only could he sing, he could dance. John can't dance, of course. John has as powerful a crowd connection I've ever seen, but I won't say it was more powerful than Michael Jackson. Uh, John may be more loyal and uh, love him for who he is, not what he, what brand he wears. Or uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, people will love Michael from still being a kid star, which same as John. Uh, Michael, you know, totally different situation. Uh, talking about the richest man in the world there for, I mean, he was spending ridiculous amounts of money on ridiculous things and helping people and doing weird things to himself. And, but the fact is, the man was great. Anyway, I ain't trying to, again, you know, I think John Farnham has made me see the light through the light, which is hard to do because it's usually hidden um, in the dark. Um, Lane Staley has made me understand sadness. Um, Maynard has made me help guide me through problems and solve them and, and been a reinforcing figure that's been there since day one and will be there through it all. Um, yeah, I mean, Hank Williams Jr. was the one that started the whole cycle of anti-establishment questioning things. The authorities fair ain't really a part of real life. Hank, Kyle, I got it all from Hank and from Dolly and Outlaw, our older classic country, unedited country. And now I'm I'm learning things from all around the world. So I'm I'm one of the luckiest guys ever. You know, the way I look at it. Uh, this is a job. It takes when you feel good, you feel great. This is the greatest job in the world. When you don't feel good, when you don't feel like being happy, uh, I don't really hide it when I don't feel good, but still, I got to put somewhat of a face on to answer comments and keep up with, with song suggestions and do reactions on days that I'd really just watch TV or something or uh, get a uh, writer's block or this, you know, um, burnout, if you will. So, you know, John is a good coordinator and better than me. But, you know, I'm, again, lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And I do have a support system and a great family, so lucky. I got Ogle, OGL. <laughs> the Aussie Army, and Tool Army, and the Nightwish Army and the Marillion Knights and the Epicans and the <laughs> I gotta say it. I used to get Iron Maiden. I used to call Megadeth all the time. I ain't gonna do that no more. 
Stevie Nicks, I love you too, girl. All right. Sorry, I'm rambling. Getting all my feelings. Let's finish this interview up. I'm ready to hear some music. John's supposed to be doing Please Don't Ask Me, but then it, I guess the copyright, they cut it out. More about being on the stage in six months with Derek than I could have learned in 15 years. Yes. Did he yes. play any practical jokes with you on stage? Because he's renowned for it. He used to do that all the time. Yeah, I know. One of the worst experiences, and I'll never forgive him for this, and he knows it, was I, I, I just finished singing a song about how much I love Charlie Girl. And Derek was about four years late on his entrance, just after the song. And I could hear the crickets croaking in the, in the, in the audience and people shuffling and looking at their programs and things, saying, when is it coming on? And he finally did come on and he, he walked straight past me over to the opposite side of the stage where he should have been and said, Mr. Mr. Studham, come over here. So I, I clenched my fist in my teeth and walked across. And he went, walked straight over the other side of the stage and said, no, 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 over here. <laughs> and by this stage I was steaming. I, I, oh. <laughs> and uh, we carried on. And he, actually, if Der Derek did throw me that day, I, I forgot every line I've ever learned for the show. And uh, he gave me my lines back. And he did apologise to me afterwards. And I said, where the hell were you? And he said, oh, I was out checking the receipts. No, no, he had, had well, a piece of the show. And the, we wanted to find out how much he'd earned that day. A piece of the show. He, he normally owns a theatre. Yeah, a normally. Day, yeah. Now, the next big jump that you're going to do is, is so you're going to go to the States, aren't you, for the first time? Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's another sort of big change of direction for you. It sure is. For me, oh, well, I, people have been saying to me for years, why haven't you gone over? I think, I think a lot of it was fear. Or not, not necessarily fear, but a feeling of inadequacy. I mean, there are a million people over there have got ten times as much talent as I have. The thing that I may have over a few of them is 15 years experience. Mm. Now I feel that I'm ready to, to try it and uh, I'll give it a good old go. You know? But I, I don't want people to think that oh, I'm deserting or anything like that because you have to open your horizons. Mm. Um, you have to go and look for, for more to do and that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Now I have Literally seen people unsubscribe from me because I pointed out the fact that, you know, sometimes Aussies can get a little overwelcoming, but yet if a homegrown Vanessa Amorosi, when she left at first, uh, she had a hard time, man. She felt like an outcast and was treated like one. And, um, Spent a lot of sleepless nights. All she wanted to do was be home with her horses and be home in the warm atmosphere. She was only wanting to be gone two years. It took six years. I mean, things happen in excess, gets popular, and it doesn't seem like I ever knew in excess was an Australian band. Uh, I've heard that about uh, ACDC. But, yeah, uh, I mean, and I, I kind of get it, you know, uh, when I found Carnival, who was a great band, he did get back to them. Uh, they're not really sure if they're Aussies or, or Kiwis. I think they got ties in both. A few of them live in New Zealand here and in Oz. Um, that band... Someone had told me, well, I don't know about that band because, well, they're new in this newer music. I said, well, not really. This band performed at the same place the Melbourne sit or the Sydney Orchestra and John Farnham played Help in, was it 96? Well, Carnival played that same arena in 98. So it is a different type of music. But heritage is heritage, right? I mean, I don't really think the type of music should stop you from supporting your home team if that's the thing you're all about, is supporting the home team. I live in North Carolina and it's been like the damn Denver Broncos. That's almost all the way across the United States. But they didn't have a Panthers or a home team when I started watching football. So I'm loyal to the team I like to begin with. So I get it. And um, I love it. I'm just saying that John 
you know, that seemed to be on his mind as well. So as much as super uh, overwhelming pride in your people feels, uh, it tends to hurt people as well if you get too overwhelmed within uh, geographies or, or basically not um, practicing much preach, you know, and we've all, we're all guilty of it. So nothing wrong with seeking stardom. That's why Vanessa and Rosie made that song, This Is Who I Am. Uh, she's as Australian as any of them. She's more Australian than John. I call her the other voice. I'd love to see them I'll be able to sing together. I know I'm talking too much. Old uh Hells in Chocala bloke, bloke, bloke. Yeah. Now you're gonna sing us a song now, aren't you? A new a new number. Mm -hmm. This was the end, end of it. it. It's called Please Don't Ask Me. Yeah. Yeah, please don't I ask him to sing it because he ain't it's yeah. gonna be cut off. It's one of the most beautiful songs I've ever had the pleasure of It singing. is. All right. Here's Johnny Farnham, please don't ask me. It don't happen. Hi. Think about it, John. And it's over. <laughs> it was over. I cut it off. Now, my next guest describes it. What? He's gone. Well, there's the voice. Hmm. All right. Let's get back. <laughs> 